Thank you guys for joining us for another interesting panel discussion as part of the Art Discourse Series during the third annual Fort Lauderdale Art and Design Week. Uh, if you didn't know what the Art Discourse Series is, we host a speaker series during our annual Art and Design Week to give our community front row access to brilliant minds over a variety of topics, uh, from artists to curators to leading professionals in specific fields, uh, to hopefully help inspire and connect and engage you to interesting projects uh, going on in our community. And I think this one you'll find pretty interesting. Uh, if you didn't know uh, who I am, my name is Evan Snow. And aside from being the co-founder and managing partner of Fort Lauderdale Art and Design Week, I also happen to serve as executive director of the Thousand Mermaids Artificial Reef Project, which builds artistically crafted uh, artificial reefs to look and act like natural reefs provide countless benefits environmentally to the ocean aside from ecotourism and other things we're about to find out about a little in this discussion and to let you know uh, who will be speaking on this discussion I want to introduce our panelists we have Shelby Thomas who is the director of research and COO for the Thousand Mermaids project which is a project of the Ocean Rescue Alliance which we'll get into in a little bit we have our reef building partner who has helped bring this project to life, helped innovate, uh, and uh, a lot of these processes is a true process uh, improvement wizard, architectural cast stone expert, uh, a quote unquote patent guy, if you've ever heard of that before, and uh, a true lover of the ocean and coral reefs, our reef builder, Mr. Christopher Xavier O'Hare of Reef Cells. And we're very excited to have uh, artist Daniel Dugan joining us from California. Uh, Daniel, through the Ocean Rescue Alliance, is our first artist that we're going to be collaborating with on futuristic reef designs. And the title of this panel discussion is about reef designs from our past, our current, and our future. So to start us off, uh, Shelby, if you could tell us just a little bit for those that aren't familiar, why coral reefs and artificial reefs uh, are very important, especially here in Southeast Florida. Certainly. Well, thanks, Evan, for having us on. I am again Shelby with the Ocean Rescue Alliance. We are a marine conservation and restoration nonprofit organization, and we hold different projects such as the A Thousand Mermaids Artificial Reef Project, where we create artistically crafted reef modules that also benefit for fish habitat as well as coral restoration. And so corals and artificial reefs are very valuable. Corals are actually the lungs of the ocean and help provide the first barrier to protecting our coastlines and to providing a home for all the fish species and fish that we eat. And as these reefs degrade, unfortunately, we're really needing to provide some supplemental structure. So these artificial reefs that we work with our partners to create actually provide that supplemental habitat that is critical for helping promote fish biodiversity and different habitat space for species that need it most. Well. And uh, Chris, you've been at this for quite a while. How did you initially get in, interested in coral reefs and uh, leading the way to creating artificial reefs? Well, I was trained as an artist and a sculptor, but I've always had an interest in nature. And I got my first face mask 50 years ago and snorkeled in the uh, Florida Keys and off the uh, Southeast coast of Florida and have ever since, and I've noticed the degradation of our coral reef and marine habitat systems. My parallel career as a architectural sculpture uh, gave me abilities and knowledge uh, of techniques that it dawned on me one day, I could apply that to creating habitat for marine organisms. And that was the start of it about 30 years ago when we started applying all the knowledge we had in architectural sculpture to the creation of uh, reef modules been doing it ever since. Phenomenal, and thankfully a lot of that architectural cast stone experience and working with concrete and different types of cement has lent itself very well to becoming an expert in this field. Could you tell us a little bit about um, just some of the previous designs of from when you initially started up into kind of where we are now and how those designs have kind of uh, evolved from abstract to more figurative art? Oh, sure. It's been real trial and error. Every time we have an idea and, and do something, we actually monitor it to, to measure its success. And then we refine it for the next deployment and the next and the next. And um, um, I guess the uh, initial 
attempts we had were, were kind of clunky and perhaps not as stable as they could have been, uh, but they've evolved. And now we've learned uh, techniques for increasing stability by using and using less material at the same time, creating the maximum amount of interior interstitial spaces, grooves, um, ledges, all the the things that are exciting when you see a natural reef, but also the uh, ability of um, organisms to egress to the interior as well as surround the outside of the uh, reef module and the uh, effect of the proximity of different reef modules to each other. So it has been um, a lot of trial and error. And I feel now we're almost at the crown of creation with this whole process because we've developed techniques now that are um, look, being looked favorably upon by uh, NOAA and uh, other um, key players in the whole marine restoration uh, business. And um, we're looking forward to those collaborations, but we, we've really got some great product now, really bio-effective um, and very uh, organic and natural looking instead of the, uh, the typical engineered um, pyramids and tetrahedrons and other things that look like they were designed by uh, an engineer as opposed to an artist. And uh, thankfully with your engineering and construction ability, we're able to construct just about anything, which lends itself very well to collaborating with artists like Daniel Dugan, uh, who his artwork coincidentally, thankfully lends itself very well to reef design. But for those that aren't familiar with your work, Daniel, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, artistry background and then uh, a little bit about what your thoughts and plans are for uh, collaborating on future reef designs. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Evan. It's good to be on with, uh, with you guys. Uh, I'm so, I mean, I can't even describe how exciting this is uh, for me. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I started just drawing on little pieces of paper. I would, it was a game I would play with myself to create a labyrinth. And the rule was that the line had to be perfectly spaced and it had to be all one line. And there was a beginning and an ending. I did it all my life through when I was a, a pre-med student in college. Um, it was just something I would do for fun. And then when I moved to New York and pursued other, other work. Um, and then I just started doing more of it and it turned into a thing. I started using different materials. And then about five years ago, I was snorkeling for my first time. I'm from a little town in Alabama. I had never snorkeled before. And when I saw these fields of brain coral, I just had a heart attack. And I was like, how did my line get down here? And then I started to learn more about um, you know, the natural parallel between what I've been doing and what already exists in nature. It was so similar that I had to take it as a sign. So I got back to LA and you know, had the wherewithal to get a space and just keep making more art and kind of learn really why I was doing what I was doing. Um, so about a year and two years ago at Art Basel, um, I met someone in the, the coral restoration uh, community who introduced me to Shelby and then here we are, it's kind of a natural fit. So for me to be able to make my art underwater look like coral and help coral regrow, help the fish, help the oceans and promote you know, the necessary awareness about how we need to save them. Uh, it's just going to be, you know, a really pivotal, very special moment to be able to be part of this. So thank you. Amazing. Guys. And I can see a little bit of the artwork behind your shoulder there uh, with some, with a couple, couple other designs. Um, Shelby, how about from a science perspective and uh, from your, from your background, what do you feel is one of the most interesting and exciting parts about collaborating with artists like Daniel, like Chris O'Hare, um, versus your, you know, previous experience with coral restoration, which isn't always the most artistic and, uh, and uh, creative. Right. Yeah. So one of the biggest things with science is the importance of being able to communicate that with people. And there's a big gap with that. And so the thing that I love about our opportunities with working with so many different artists is the ability to really connect with people and engage people that typically know nothing with science and being able to build that awareness towards it. It's really a, a beautiful story. And, and just as Chris mentioned, we're able to do and modify designs that are not only biologically relevant, but they can also be artistic and incorporate art and still be very beautiful and also mimic natural reefs. So we have so many different diverse ideas and ways that we can incorporate all types of artwork to make a really impactful message and help bringing that connection back to the ocean. One of the, the biggest things with ocean conservation is it, the ocean's often out of sight, out of mind for many people. 
it's just a blanket of water. And for people that live in the middle of the US or in parts of the world where they don't see the ocean on a daily basis, they often don't get to think about it much. And so enabling this art aspect really gets that connection going and gets people to think about the ocean in a different way. If they either have a loved one or a new art reef that was created, it creates a new engaging perspective. Amen. And uh, we are making quite an impact. And uh, for those of you that aren't aware, over the last two years of uh, deployments from the Thousand Mermaids Artificial Reef Project, with Chris's support, we've deployed uh, 70 reefs in Palm Beach County alone. And now the sites are growing into Dania Beach in Broward County and uh, even beyond into the Mesoamerican Reef and into the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, Chris, from when you started, you know, many, many years ago, um, to where we are now, what do you what do you want the impact to be? Thankfully, we're on the cutting edge of coral restoration, but in regards to the art, what do you want people to take away when they see one of your sculptures? What do you want them to know? What do you want them to feel? And what do you want them to uh, have a, like an imprint or a, uh, a thought that they'll hopefully hold on to for the rest of their life? That's, that's a complicated question. Uh, to put it simply, the art is just my way of uh, reaching out and communicating to people. I have no idea what they will feel or how they will appreciate it, or even if they'll like it, but I know it'll provoke them in some way. Uh, I can't really say how people react to the art. I know how I react to art that I either observe or I create. That is, it just fills my heart with joy. I mean, I'm sure Daniel will support me in this, that when you're creating art or when you're seeing good art, it's just, it's one of the most wonderful experiences. The fact that we can create art to put under the water, uh, to put in a situation where when it gains attention, it will draw awareness to the problem that's going on under the sea. Uh, that is probably the most important aspect of the whole art, um, the reef art. And um, I think we're effective with that. But the, the other thing the art does is by drawing people to come and experience it, they're drawn away from the natural reef. And that is uh, critically important because so many ecosystems are just very sensitive to interference by um, um, basically kind-minded observers who just want to experience it. If we can provide an opportunity for them to have that experience on this artificial reef, enjoying the art and the, the habitats that we create and all the marine life that we attract, we can leave that natural reef alone to um, prosper on its own. And if, if I could add to that really quick Please. too, um, art is just really powerful and it's universal. You know, it's a, it's a language that reaches everyone and can make people feel all different ways. It's been used in history to connect communities and, and tell stories. And I think that's the most beautiful thing about it is we have that ability to make people feel differently about our oceans and feel connected to it. And using this engaging way that we can bring out art where we connect history. Um, for example, one of our projects that we're now expanding is in Mexico, where we're looking to create a Mayan-themed artificial reef that really connects the local community and that history of the community as well. So there's just so much value that art brings to helping really connect with people. Amen. And we're drawing people in, in terms of their interests. We're drawing people away from the natural reefs to hopefully our artificial reefs to allow time for them to heal. Daniel, what are you drawing up uh, in terms of some of your ideas for uh, our future collaborations with uh, reef designs that you have in mind? Well, I thought the, the it would be made sense just to go from my original understanding of what brain coral were uh, to make something that represented kind of my aha moment with my connection with my art and with nature. So this is uh, an example of what I saw um, in, um, I was off the coast of uh, Belize. So uh, I made this rendering, I made a drawing uh, that you can see in the, the presentation. Um, and then I made a 3D model. So I'd like to replicate a brain coral. Maybe have a few of these, small, medium, and large, so that it can you know, be made with, um, with the, you know, the, the keeping in mind what kind of uh, fish we can attract and what kind of uh, natural elements can be involved. I mean, I was a biology major, so this is so thrilling to jump back into biology and um, have it intersect with art 
you know, I make all of my art because it helps me, um, you know, connect with people and tell the story of the line, which is, you know, surrendering to your life and the events that are happening for you. And now to merge it with, um, with a cause, it's going to be helpful to our environment and to each other. It's going to be, you know, so satisfying. So um, I think we'll start with the, the, the brain coral replica. And then with a project like Mexico would be really great to have some parameters, a directive. So to keep something Mayan themed would be a dream to make uh, something pyramidal, uh, maybe to replicate a pyramid uh, like Chichen Itza, which, uh, which is uh, you know, in that area. So it looks like an underwater, like lost world, uh, Indiana Jones style. I think that'd be really cool for experience for divers to see, but also uh, mostly for the animals that it could attract. Amen. And also and to add for the artificial sites, so just as Daniel spoke to doing the dome design that looks like a brain coral, we outplant coral on our, all of our artificial reefs that have coral in the area. And so our goal would be to target putting different boulder species like brain coral right on those modules. So they'll actually turn into living artwork um, that also enables fish habitat. So it'll be really, really beautiful uh, once all the coral is out there as well. Yeah, we made a really uh, beautiful rendering where it got helped to make a rendering that um, we can show here where it shows this structure with a little brain coral on it. And it was just so, uh, when I saw that, Exciting. It made my heart melt. It's going to be so cool. I don't Amen. know what it's going to be like. Well, you know, you know with, with every structure we make, it would be wonderful to make, you know, a Turanian version so that there's a, a freestanding permanent sculpture uh, nearby to attract people just like all public art does that people can interact with. Maybe they can walk through it or they wonder what is this and I'll be there when I can and uh, anyone else to explain, oh, you can go underwater and see this. And this is actually helping our environment and helping our fish and helping us to live. Uh, so that's gonna be a really cool uh, interactive part of all the, all the deployments. Amen. And thankfully Chris was forward thinking enough to create some above water replicas uh, to draw in those people that might not dive and might not ever get to see the artwork underwater. So you might see uh, around Dania Beach or if you ever visit the Pier 66 Marina, uh, what we call a mermaid tail selfie station where somebody can walk up from the waist down and basically pose as a mermaid and we use some of these designs and some of this above water artwork to help draw in interest uh, create more user-generated content and social media and marketing. Um, and this is just another ingenious idea and design uh, from Chris O'Hare. Chris, um, if you could maybe share a little bit on the design part, uh, aside from the figurative artwork uh, that you've created, can you tell us a little bit about how the designs of the coral lock have evolved to our current outplanting mechanisms and, and how that is still artistic and the artistic elements that you're integrating uh, with our current deployments? Uh, yes. Uh, my, my mission from a very early uh, stage in life was always to incorporate art in the service of nature. And uh, to do that, you basically have to develop certain engineering strategies, you know, how does, how do pieces go together? How can you assemble things? How do you make them durable, uh, non-toxic, uh, stable in the water? Uh, and all this engineering background, you, you learn different techniques for attachment and, and um, uh, just the, the physics of, um, of materials. And when I saw a video of um, corals being grown in the nursery, and it's very fascinating to see a whole bunch of corals that have been divided up into small pieces and mounted on frags and grown in tanks where they're then deployed in the ocean. I thought, well, that's just so clever. But then I saw the divers who would take a, a basket of these precious corals and spend a whole tank full of air to chisel away at the, uh, the substrate underwater to create a, uh, an area where they can epoxy or cement on uh, corals one at a time and they would perhaps get 10 on a tank full of air and I thought well that's so inefficient so I started to to go into that that uh, closet where you keep all the ideas and experiences from the past and it occurred to me why not create a um, mechanical fastener for these corals where they can be grown on small discs that had an actual 
thread on the bottom, then it was a matter of, well, what's the best kind of thread? Is it a, a national thread? Is it a coil thread? So it turned out a coil thread or like a pickle jar thread um, was the most uh, easy not to get fouled. So we ended up basically creating these, these little devices that the coil could be mounted to and then transport it out onto the reef. And then if we build a module that had a whole bunch of receivers, say two, three, four, 500 receivers every few inches on the module, the diver can basically take these precious corals and thread them in and then go to the next one, thread it in. And on a tank full of air, instead of doing 10 or 15, perhaps do 150 to 200 of them. So now we could exponentially create coral reefs instead of the laborious methods used in the past by people who are well-intentioned, but uh, didn't have the same experience um, in that engineering aspect of it because they're more concerned with uh, the propagation of the species. Um, so we, we've developed strategies now where we can actually take those corals and, and thread them on. And of course, that led to the development of different types of, of reef modules to accept different species of uh, corals, some that would take the uh, the stony corals, others the uh, branching corals, uh, but all the same basic concept of mechanically threading them into the uh, substrate. And uh, it's got such great potential. We're getting a lot of great uh, feedback, and I, I believe it'll, it, it, it may become the industry standard. I hope it does, because I know in situations where thousands of acres, for instance, in the Florida Keys need to be restored and repopulated, uh, that's an achievable thing now with this, um, this um, engineering technique. Amen. And then it also lends itself well uh, through a lot of the innovation and design to being able to integrate uh, supporters and people that want to contribute at uh, various levels. Shelby, could you share a little bit about our current uh, designs and innovations with regards to the plaques and with regards to some of the other artwork opportunities that we're offering with the uh, celebratory and memorial reefs? Sure. So yeah, we really wanted to provide a way to give people an opportunity to help with the solution. So a lot of people are where <laughs> corals are dying and there's a, a big effort that's needed to help with restoration, but they don't necessarily have a direct action to help other than volunteering or donating. And one of the, the things that we came up with the Ocean Rescue Alliance in partnership with Reef Cells is to actually apply plaques that have coral outplanting opportunities, as well as helping build beneficial fish habitat as either donations of plaques or people can create their individual module and in reef habitats of either a person or directly uh, creating a, one of our module varieties that we have. So we just started releasing those and we've been adding some of the plaques and habitat modules to our Thousand Mermaid site. But as we expand, they'll be able to receive at any one of our artificial reef sites all over the world and engage anybody from anywhere in the world to create a reef or out, plan a plaque or coral on any of our modules. It's amazing. And we're trying to make these up opportunities more readily available and easily accessible. Uh, Re reducing the barrier to entry in terms of the price that it would generally cost to create a reef. So we're working to make more opportunities for people that want to get involved and support anywhere from, you know, 200, 300, $500, uh, because not everybody understandably uh, can contribute $7,500 or above to create their own individual reef. So thankfully with Chris's uh, engineering process improvement, patent brain and Shelby's Coral restoration, marine biology, and just overall brilliant mind and working with ingenious artists like Daniel Dugan, we're able to bring uh, the art and the science together, uh, also integrating some of the latest technology um, to even increase the efficiency. Um, if we could just maybe touch on the VR component and the 3D scanning of how we're uh, improving these designs and then how that could also lend itself well uh, to Daniel and future designs, uh, Shelby or Chris. Yeah, um, I, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, we're using virtual reality in multiple ways. So one of our goals was also to help connect people who typically may not be a diver or even be near the ocean. So we're helping turn some of our artificial reef sites into virtual reality sites that you can dive from your computer and actually interact with the modules and outplant coral and also come to workshops and really learn about the different species of coral as well as fish that we monitor and actually engage on from your home and, and see the reef underwater. Uh, the other adaptive technology, we're really using uh, this VR to and 3D scanning to advance our technologies. And Chris at Reef Cells 
we can 3D scan any type of image or person into a direct reef module. So we went from casting people at a, with a thousand mermaids artificial reef project to now being able to just scan them and turn them directly into a full scale module. And Chris, I'll let you talk more about that process. Uh, we actually had one of our largest sculptures created to date, which was the American mermaid, Emily Gugliano, which is about 13 feet tall. And I'll let Chris uh, speak on that process. Well, sure. Uh, originally, we would take a model, slather them with Vaseline, cover them with wet plaster bandages, and then from that create an exact replica that we then fashion a mermaid tail or, or whatever, but we'd always try to get some kind of a gesture that was suggestive of, of, of something that would inspire the onlooker. Um, but that had limitations. You can only do an exact replica. Uh, then we moved into uh, the digital age where we actually scan them electronically and create a digital topographic map of their surface. And from that use uh, CNC routers um, to replicate them in a substrate. And the, the beauty of that is you can scale that up. So that last particular mermaid you're talking about is actually uh, two times life size, I believe. And um, it's just, it's stunning. Uh, there's something about seeing things larger than life. I mean, so many artists have capitalized on that from a gigantic clothespins or um, badminton pucks, uh, uh, whatever those things are called. Uh, it's just, it's kind of exciting to see something that's out of scale from what you normally experience. So when you do see these things underwater, a large uh, replica of a, of a person, it's, um, it's exciting. But that's our, that's our technique today. We, we're doing the digital scanning and replicating them electronically. And that, that makes it really beneficial because you could send anything from any, anywhere in the world and he can take a small replica and scale it to triple the size even, as well as looking at just an image and translating that into a module. So we have a lot of adaptability um, now with technology. Yeah, That's I would great. like to add something else too. Um, Shelby mentioned before the, um, the, the name plaques, and I think it's just wonderful that people can be recognized for their contribution to the uh, reef, and uh, it's great to be able to put people's name on that, but the, the module, the mini module we use to do that actually creates what I call a micro habitat, which is so important for the juvenile fish trying to escape predation until they reach adulthood, and therefore could have more and more children. Every fish that we can protect until it reaches um, reproductive maturity means the fishery can be expanded exponentially. So those small modules with nameplates, uh, whether they happen to hold someone's uh, ashes or just a, a commemorative plate, uh, actually create such an important, significant portion of the artificial reef uh, for that, um, the, for the purpose of growing a juvenile fish to adulthood. And, and in fact, too, um, each, each person's donation directly helps contribute to that fish habitat, as Chris said, as well as having the ability to outplant coral right next to your name. I don't think there's really anywhere in the world that you can say the same opportunity exists. So they're actually directly getting a plaque that will have coral next to their names eventually that will grow over and they're directly contributing to restoration. And every time it comes and looks at it, it's going to know exactly who is responsible for that right. coral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And th thankfully, there are a lot of people interested. Um, there are a lot of people that want to support. Um, Daniel, if somebody was, let's say, an art collector of yours and they wanted to support the project in terms of uh, commissioning you for a custom design, what are some opportunities uh, and what are some other ideas that you have in the works in regards to? There's the creation of the reefs and but prints, you know, limited edition merchandise. What are some other thoughts uh, that you have and opportunities? Should somebody be listening and say, I want a Daniel Dugan custom design reef? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm, I'm really excited to see. Uh, there's a lot of options here. I, um, a lot of my sales are commissions. Uh, someone just commissioned me to draw an octopus. Um, so I drew that original and I can, uh, I would use that one as a, um, I'll give, send you the image, but we could use that as uh, a limited edition print that they could buy, and part of the money can go towards uh, our project. Um, I also, um, the, the dome that I made uh, was based on a drawing that I made into like a sterling silver medallion. Uh, I can <laughs> show you a picture of that. Uh, so there's, that can be made in um, silver or gold. So this is a piece I would love to show 
uh, and share so they can buy a piece of jewelry that has to do with the coral project and help raise money for that. Um, and there, yeah, I mean, it, it could be anything. So uh, someone could commission a piece and then we can work on it going towards the project. So it's kind of the sky's the limit. Um, yeah, there are a couple other images I'm working on, some sea fans uh, that Shelby and I were saying would be a really cool image. So there's a there's a, a whole body of work that I could create the around imagery underwater that we can use to raise money. And in exchange, the, the investor gets a piece of art. Uh, so we're gonna work on building out that collection and and then go from there. So it's an exciting thing to invest in because you're you're getting something physical on your wall you can talk about uh, and enjoy, but you're also uh, you know helping a really good cause. So uh, I'm excited to launch all those. But feel free to follow me and uh, find me on Instagram, Daniel Dugan Art, and let's dream big. Yes. Uh, where can we find you, Shelby, on social media and the project? Yeah, so you can find us at both the A Thousand Mermaids Artificial Reef Project on Instagram, it's A Thousand Mermaids, and the Ocean Rescue Alliance as well on both social and our websites are oceanrescuealliance.org. And you can find Chris O'Hare's creations at Reef Cells and also at CXO Art. Chris is a very established artist and has the ability to create just about anything. Um, so I guess it'd be worth mentioning uh, on the memorial reef front, uh, we are able to create a likeness of a deceased family member, an individual, uh, based off of photographs or other imagery, and we're able to integrate very tasteful uh, tributes to, uh, you know, to a deceased family member. On our last memorial reef, uh, we integrated paw prints from the family's uh, dog. We integrated uh, plaques with the family's names on them. Uh, you know, a lot of different things that, that can even give more legs to the reef than just the actual sculpture itself. And it's kind of the gift that keeps giving as people continue to dive them, take underwater photos of them. Uh, you know, they're going to live forever under the sea floor. So it's a great way to create a, a tasteful uh, living legacy that actually contributes to helping the ocean. Anything else yeah. that you guys would want to uh, share before we uh, open it up to question answer. Yeah, and uh, to speak to the memorial aspect too, Evan, really quickly, I think that's one of the most beautiful things about the project as well as the ability to change the public's uh, perception and relationship with the ocean through this component. Because a lot of people turn to these traditional burial options and being able to create a reef for your family or for a loved one or a celebratory event really makes it personal and it helps change that relationship. So even if you're not a diver, we take before and after photos and videos and this donation and uh, celebration of a life actually helps support life for generations to come. And it also changes that relationship. So when you're coming to visit a loved one, you know, you're not just in a cemetery with a tombstone in front of you. You're actually diving into a world full of life all around you and knowing that their memory will live on for generations to come while helping the ocean. Beautiful. And it doesn't all have to be, uh, you know, sad memorial reefs. We are working on creating celebratory reefs should when your team wins the championship or if you want to mm -hmm. celebrate an annual fishing tournament uh, and have some of the you know proceeds be able to actually give back to the ocean to hopefully create more fish there's many many ways for people to get involved um, the sky really is the limit and uh, we encourage you to follow us along on social medias check out the website check out the YouTube we've got a lot of great underwater uh, footage for you to see a little bit more of what we're talking about um, and we do have plenty of opportunities for you to get involved we have an upcoming deployment in uh, the spring and summer of 2021 uh, at the beginning of our Broward County Reef with the great city of Dania Beach Florida and we're gonna continue expanding our sites into the U.S. Virgin Islands the Mesoamerican Reef and eventually uh, even to Australia and beyond. So please do follow along. And uh, if you found this talk interesting, uh, there's plenty more where that came from. You can look them up on the Fort Lauderdale Art and Design Week website at www.ftladw.com. 
Uh, this talk and speaker series was made possible with support from Los Olas Capital Arts and Los Olas Capital Advisors. And we appreciate you taking the time to tune in. And now we'll turn it over to question and answers. Yeah, I have a question. Daniel, I'd love for you to share more about what we were discussing when I visited you in LA at your studio. You are really talking about that connection with your artwork and nature. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Uh, so when I was underwater and I saw the brain coral, I, I started to, I realized I needed to learn what this pattern was and uh, what does it even mean and why was I doing it? And I, I learned about reaction uh, diffusion uh, there's a there's a, a, a mathematical formula for this pattern um, that's very similar to mine. Uh, the line is equally spaced from itself, and it grows in a way that uh, that really mimics what I've been doing. So that was like a big uh, epiphany for me to see that natural connection between the labyrinth and also uh, my work. And as I learned more about labyrinths, not only in nature but labyrinths created by man, you know, they date, date back you know, hundreds of years. And when new civilizations would come to lands, they would first build a labyrinth. And they're still exploring why they would do that. And what one theory is that instead of going on a pilgrimage and traveling very far uh, to learn more, you can build a labyrinth and go on a meditative walk where you have no choices to make other than to observe and move forward, which is the difference between a labyrinth and a maze. A labyrinth is universal. It is one line and um, there's no stressful decisions to make uh, other than moving forward. And that's when I realized what my line meant and it represents life and time, which is why the line doesn't cross or touch because our, our lives are essentially documented uh, in time. Uh, and to accept all of the events that happen to us, the emotions that come up, the things that we love and expect and the things that we don't love and don't expect uh, to remember that they are all happening for us. They are part of our life as a complex human being and all of the emotions are valuable. So a lot of philosophical um, helpful things came out of kind of my understanding of what the line meant. And that's what I get to share with people when they ask me, what does my art mean to me? Um, so they each represent a meditation on, on surrendering to your life and remembering that it's all happening for you. So there's just so much uh, connection with that and nature and uh, you know, the purpose and function of your life. So for me, it's helpful. I know when things go haywire, I just have to remember, you know, okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is what this is supposed to be and uh, I don't need to control it and I can accept it and, and try to see how it, it's gonna be helping my life. Um, so yeah, I think somehow nature told me that when I was 10 years old. <laughs> And yeah, I think, I think that's so beautiful. And I mean, it even ties in that the human brain almost looks like a labyrinth. And then there's yeah. brain I coral. Brain. That was actually one of the first pieces I drew. Oh uh, yeah, I remember you uh, saying anatomical that. Anatomical pieces, I drew uh, an anatomical heart and then mm -hmm. brain as well. Uh, yeah. So yeah, maybe we could do the brain prints for a fundraiser for an investment <laughs> switch uh, or t-shirts, sweat, sweatshirts, hoodies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, lots, lots of, of abilities move, lots moving of forward, but I really, I really love that your work and involves so much complexity and has such a deeper rooted meaning into not only life, but nature itself and um, the different patterns that you can find within nature. It really tells a historical story that ties in nicely. Yeah, one last point that just came to me was that when I'm drawing ink on paper, I can't mess up or I have to start over. So every decision I make is final, um, which could be stressful, but it, it allows me to practice um, accepting my decisions, knowing you can't change them. You can't go back. You can just say, okay, well, this is what happened and move forward. So um, that's another thing that I talk about a lot in terms of if I did mess up, I could start over or I could just leave it and say, well, that's what happened. <laughs> and I'm okay with that because nothing in life is perfect. No day mm -hmm. is perfect, no event, you know? Uh, so that's, that's one kind of um, thought I try to leave with people. Yeah, and I think that's in incredible. And even as you can see the artwork that Daniel has in, in the back, that's all one continuous line, that portrait. And just to be able to 
visualize that. And as you were saying, know that as the decisions you're making with that line to make a grander picture that has way more deep fine tuned details, it, extremely difficult. And I think it's just beautiful, the whole story and, and metaphorical philosophical meaning behind everything. So yeah, really love it. And we're, we're super excited to uh, work together. And did, did you ever um, think that your artwork would come under the ocean? No, I had no idea. I mean, you know, I didn't really think of myself as an artist until I got the studio about four years ago. Um, and I never thought I would make a sculpture. This will be my first sculpture ever. Uh, oh. So you would have thought that, yeah, no, I would be, it would be underwater and it would, you know, help the environment. And uh, yeah, this is, this is kind of all new to me in a, in a way, uh, which everything I make, I work with wood and wire and um, ink and acrylic and all different mm -hmm. materials. So this is a really exciting opportunity to make something three-dimensional and to have it underwater. It's just going to be, yeah, very yeah. satisfying. So and I, I think, think that's a, a great transition to, um, Chris, I, I know, especially with being a sculpture artist is difficult on its own, but being able to correct, create structures that sustain different hydrodynamics under the ocean is a whole nother story. So what are some of the challenges that you face when creating modules that go in the ocean? When you create art um, on land, um, you don't have to worry too much about stability or toxicity or uh, durability. Uh, and also whether uh, an animal that happens to touch it will uh, be harmed, but, um, well, maybe you do, but in the ocean, that's extremely critical. Um, and, and rightly so, there's a lot of government agencies, a lot of uh, players that have a keen interest in what goes into the ocean and you have to, uh, um, follow their lead. So there's, you're limited in the number of materials you can use because even something as, as simple as uh, metal, uh, iron gives off ions which promote algal growth uh, and algae smothers corals. So we don't want to have any exposed iron. Um, one of the things we found that was super that uh, it's, we seem to be unique in this is that um, calcium carbonate, the, uh, the backbone of all marine animals that have exoskeletons, and they pull the calcium carbonate out of the uh, seawater, which is only really, uh, I think, 40% salt. The rest of it's dissolved minerals like calcium carbonate. So by putting calcium carbonate into the module, we actually promote uh, attachment by uh, sensual organisms, these attaching organisms, and they, they seem to really prosper. But it's... Um, it's, it's a wonderful challenge to, to, to think of all the dynamics under the ocean and how uh, you need to conform and, um, and, and work with that. And, uh, a lot of the modules that we've seen um, or that have been used historically are not stable. Even, even sunken ships can move in a storm event and threaten a native um, a localized coral that's um, naturalized. So um, you have to be really concerned about stability you also have to be able to transport on a barge and have a crane lifted up. So there's limitations on the weight and size, but you can also collectively assemble things underwater to create uh, very large uh, installations. But um, my, my first concern with building and developing modules was habitat. I was concerned about how to increase fish stocks, how to provide habitat for all the various types of fish and also the various sizes of them during their life cycle. Uh, scientists found out recently that about half of all the fish on a coral reef, for instance, uh, were less than a half an inch in length. And w our original modules we designed um, had these large cavernous spaces inside, which we thought that was just brilliant. But as it turns out, that was just a place for predatory pelagics to kind of hang out and wait for those small fish to venture in where they can be gobbled up. So now we've designed modules that actually have uh, isolated chambers where small fish can escape predation by habitating in spaces that do not connect with those larger uh, openings. So we still have the larger cells for those large fish, but we have the smaller ones as well that are isolated from each mm -hmm. other. So it's just a part of the learning experience and just observation. The more you look, the more you, you, you get ideas about how to make something better. But the, um, the, the major thing about building uh, artificial reef modules is just how wonderful it is to think that you can fashion something with your hands and, and use your brain to think of something and then create it. And it actually for eternity can have a, an environmental benefit on the ocean. That's just, it just makes you feel wonderful. 
Definitely. And definitely respective to any other artificial reefs out there, you know, we're really taking this targeted approach where we're using science to inform our future decisions, but also incorporating arts. So, you know, they're not just any average module, just as you were speaking to, we're making relevant modifications consistently that help advance biological processes such as coral recruitment and different benthic growths and increasing fish biodiversity and diverse habitat. So I think that's one of the most unique perspectives is that we're able to really provide that habitat and continuously augment our approach as we move forward and just make it continuously better. If I might add, most people don't realize it, but the majority of the ocean, the shallow ocean, is really nothing more than a desert. There's a sandy bottom with thousands of miles of just open space. Mm -hmm. When you have a natural reef, a uh, mature reef that's producing, um, where the corals are actually reproducing and those gametes are floating in the water looking for a place to land, the majority of them don't find a place to land and they're either eaten up by predators or they end up landing on sand where they can't attach because there's no substrate there. When we create substrate, especially if it's down current from a natural reef, we're actually providing a place for those corals offspring to land and attach. And if we create another uh, reef, those will attach and we'll have a leapfrog effect of these, um, the expansion of an original colony that might've been originally very small, but now can just uh, grow up the coastline. And uh, that's a great thing to think that you're taking a uh, desert, uh, basically a virtual desert and creating oases where uh, more and more coral can develop. Because uh, there's been a theory, a scientific theory that when you build an artificial reef, you really don't create more um, ecosystem, you're basically pulling organisms away from an existing one. Um, but then I, I don't think that's exactly true. I think the more structure we could put in there, the more opportunities, the more people, the more, I'm sorry, people, the more um, organisms will have offspring and will develop and create more ecosystems. So I'm very excited about that. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's been an ongoing debate between the science uh, community, but it's almost as what they'd say the Romans would say, if you build it, they will come. And that's certainly the case with the fish. We see recruitment date, even the day of, there'll be fish that are living right, right in the, the reefs automatically. And as Chris spoke to, we have the ability to translocate reefs as well in areas. Um, as reefs are dying, we can add reefs just north or south of the areas and help continuously make a, a new reef down the line and create an interconnected ecosystem. So Chris and Daniel, we're coming all together on a project to bring some of Daniel's artwork to life. And Chris, I wanted to talk, uh, wanted you to talk a little bit more about the process and Daniel's gonna come down to Florida to help out with it. Could you guys elaborate more about what we're gonna be getting into in the next few months? Sure, I could start with that. Um, we have uh, a facility, it's, I guess it's about five acres now uh, with a complete sculpture studio and production facility. We do the, the design, the sculpting, the mold making, pattern work, the casting and the finishing, uh, creating. Uh, so we're, we're putting this studio at uh, Daniel's disposal and other artists who might join us in the future. Uh, and so basically, if you come here, uh, we put all this uh, uh, build, this process, this um, these assets at their disposal. We have um, truckloads of raw material to work with and it's it's really like a, a playground for an artist and um it's here Yay. ready to work yeah Dan daniel can you tell us some of um your hopes and what kind of impact you hope to partner with uh, the ocean rescue alliance and coming together on this project yeah i just have to say i'm so i feel so lucky so fortunate to have met you guys and to be able to come down and work with chris and get dirty and learn about the materials that we can use and be part of something experimental or be part of project uh, material that we know will work. Um, it's just going to be so thrilling. So um, yeah, to work with all of you guys, I mean, my hopes are that, you know, we all will just work together and continue to learn about how we can help the, the habitats and, uh, really cause a chain reaction in, you know, in ecology and uh, in ways that impact all of our lives. You know, the humans and the animals, we have to find a way to, uh, you know, help each other, live together and, you know, do no harm. So I think doing that, talking about doing that, um, hopefully will inspire 
others to uh, not only join our project, but to take up their own and uh, whether they be underwater or not. Um, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm so excited that my first sculpture is gonna be underwater guided by, you know, biologists and scientists and other artists like Chris. Uh, it's just, um, it's gonna be an incredible fusion of, you know, energy. All I cool. just wanted to, uh, with Chris mentioning, sharing the resources and facilities at his disposal, I uh, just wanted to give one more thanks. None of this would be possible without Chris O'Hare and his generous contributions, not only to the ocean, to our projects, to the communities, but Chris has spent many, many years of his own doing his own research and development from his early stages of, of reef designs, uh, Firehawk Reef to where we are now. Um, it, it's a really unique combination to have an architectural capstone expert, a landscape architect, a concrete patent process improvement guy, also love the ocean, also be very passionate about coral reefs and art. And it was really, it took a Chris O'Hare uh, to make this project happen. And we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this if it wasn't for him. And he's very modest and probably wouldn't have said that. So we just wanted to say thank you, Chris, for, for, for supporting our reefs, for supporting the art, for supporting the oceans and for making these resources at our disposal so that we can innovate uh, and really be on the cutting edge of coral restoration and public art. Uh, so we thank you for that. Attorney. Well, thank you, Evan. I just wanted to say that it's not just me. Um, I've got work in um, Asia, uh, the Middle East, uh, throughout America, a lot of work for every university and state government, and so many clients, I think over 2,000, 200,000 projects to date, but every one of those projects, every one of those clients actually contributed to these reefs because it was their money, the profit portion of their projects that went into creating uh, this reef and all this experimenting. So I'm really kind of sitting as the, uh, the top of a giant heap of people who may not even be aware of uh, the contribution they've made. It's beautiful. And it's a gift that keeps giving. And uh, thankfully, uh, you know, we're, we're really just really just at the beginning of the cutting edge of innovative, uh, innovating new designs, innovating new app planning mechanisms, and innovating new opportunities to collaborate with artists. And we hope by this time next year, when we're discussing Art Fort Lauderdale, maybe in 2022 and Fort Lauderdale Art and Design Week, we could potentially have um, calls to artists and in competitions for artists to submit their designs, uh, to have a spot, to have your artistic idea as part of a future reef, uh, the conversation that we've been having recently. So please do stay tuned because there's only more good stuff where this came from. Certainly. And I, I think also the, the big takeaway is the fact that anybody can be involved and anyone can help. And Chris didn't initially come from a marine biology background, yet he's done so much for the marine environments and has enabled so much creation out of his work and passion. So that really just goes to the fact that you don't have to be a marine biologist. You don't necessarily have to know anything about the ocean to be able to help and make an impact. And same thing with art, we're able to combine and we're really at this merge of between technology, art and science and being able to merge this and create something really beautiful together is just great to, to be a part of it. And we're so thankful to have met everyone and we're really excited to move forward with our future projects. Amen. And if you want to get the inspiration to get involved, aside from this talk, uh, I wasn't into the oceans and coral reefs either a few years ago, but after watching the Chasing Coral documentary on Netflix, that was my aha moment that led me down this path. And I recommend that to anybody who might have any interest or anybody that you think would potentially have an interest in the coral reefs and in the oceans, have them watch Chasing Coral. It'll, it'll change your life. What I'm looking forward to um, as we expand on this whole project is to engage more and more people to become involved uh, and, and just get a fire in their belly and know that they can make a difference because there's so, like I said before, uh, swimming on these reefs for 50 years and, and watching what's happened and not realizing it because it happens so incrementally in small steps. But then you look back, I look back at some of the pictures I took when I was in high school and it's like, wow, what happened to that? So I really think engaging people, bringing the, calling the attention, the awareness with the artwork um, 
we can in invite a lot of people who will get the same joy and sense of self worth and self-satisfaction of making a difference in that marine environment because it is such an important marine environment i mean coral reefs are responsible for so much of the oxygen we breathe the food we eat um, medicines that are developed from these uh, animals it's just uh it's a plethora of um, wonder and uh, opportunity and i'm just looking forward to other people joining us and making this happen Definitely. And, and they have the ability to put their own creative touch and their own piece of themselves into the ocean forever. And I think that's usually it, no one would have that opportunity. So it's really unique to be able to provide that and people have a direct way to engage and help. We're really looking forward to finally getting some coral out at the Thousand Mermaid site here in the next six months. Hopefully uh, midsummer we'll be planting corals of opportunity. And uh, we've been working with Chris at Reef Cells with the habitat modules of different designs for different species, such as boulder corals and acropora, uh, orbicella favelata. We just outplanted with the Coral Restoration Foundation in the Keys. And we'll be doing a lot more outplanting with different organizations coming soon. So stay tuned and plenty of ways to get involved, guys, and adopt a coral, create a plaque, create a reef, donate, even just sharing this video would do us a whole lot.